Good day, Eco 231 students. It is week six, and in this week, you will work through chapter six. Now, it is very important that you take note that sections 6.1 and 6.2 are strictly for self study. I will be skipping these two sections, the firms and their production decisions, and production with one variable input altogether as these two aspects of the theory of the firm was taught in ECO 151 last year. It was dealt with extensively in ECO 151. So I will be skipping those two sections because that is revision and I will continue with section 6.3 and 6.4. Now up until now you have been focusing on solely the demand side and the behaviors of consumers. Now, in Chapter 6, we are going to switch to the behavior of the producer. So we're focusing on the supply side now. Firms have to produce efficiently. So they have to consider the cost of production and they need to determine how much output they are going to produce. So we are going to discuss these very important decisions that a firm must make in Chapter 6 as well as Chapter 7. So these two chapters combined gives us what we call the theory of the firm. We're looking at the supply side and it describes how cost minimizing decisions are made by the firm and our cost varies with output. So when we speak about cost minimizing decisions here, we are again thinking about an optimization type problem because ultimately firms want to maximize profits. Now, in the same way that we could study consumer behavior, we needed to first understand um, consumer preferences, we needed to understand the budget constraints that the consumers face, and we needed to understand how they make these decisions on what combination to choose given that they have this budget constraint. So ultimately, they could maximize the utility. Now, we are going to look at production decisions in the same way. Now, firstly, production technology, that is this first point over here. Production technology describes how inputs can get transformed into outputs. So your inputs are your factors of production that you should recall. Your labor, your capital, your land, and how that then is transformed into outputs. So you can have different combinations of labor and capital that can be produced or, or used to produce a given output. Secondly, firms also need to consider the cost of production, right? So when we think about cost, you now need to think about these factors of production. They have a cost associated with it, and that is the price of the input. So my labor, I'm remunerated for my labor, which is my factor of production, with wages and salaries. So firms need to consider the prices of these inputs. That is labor, it would be the wages for capital, it would be rent. And then lastly, the input choices. So when you speak about input choices, what combination of those inputs, labor and capital, because that will be the two factors of production we consider, the, that will be how they need to decide what combination of those two will produce a certain level of output, bearing in mind the prices of those goods. So you can see this process, it follows the same thought pattern as to what you did when you looked at consumption equilibrium. So we'll also deal with production equilibrium, looking at cost minimization in chapter seven. Now slides 3 to 16 cover section 6.1 and 6.2 which is strictly for self-study. So you will begin by revising why the firm exists and understand the firm's production technology which is represented by a production function. And then the production function is used to explain how firms' output can change when labor is varied. And here the other factors of the production is kept fixed. So this is what you learned in your first year in Eco 151. And up to that point, it is revision. I will then continue 
with narrating from slide 17 and this is the more general case of a firm where all inputs are varied. So section 6.2 dealt with only one variable input and all other inputs were fixed and this was the short run. Now you know that in the long run all inputs can be varied. So six point, section 6.3 now examines production with two variable inputs and the inputs we will consider are labor and capital. So if you look, have a look at table 6.4, we have different combinations of capital and labor as our inputs. And those inputs will be used to produce the output food. Now the table shows you those different outputs that can be achieved. So if you look at the middle region of the table, this gives you the various outputs that can be achieved. If you look at the first column, this gives you the capital inputs so using one unit of capital, two units of capital, three units of capital, four units, five units, etc. And if you read across the top row from left to right, this gives you your labor inputs. So one unit of labor, two units of labor, three units of labor, etc. And if we just look at one example, for instance, let's say we take two units of capital. So two units of capital being our input and three units of labor. Our output that can be achieved with that combination of capital and labor is 75 units of food. So notice what happens if we, let's say we keep our capital input fixed with two units and we allow our labor input to vary but we're keeping capital fixed at two over there as you increase each unit of labor we can see that our output increases from 40 to 60 to 75 to 85 to 95 but notice what happens with each additional unit of labor and the change in output output increases you can see that with each unit of labor that is added, but the increase in output diminishes. So it goes from 20, then it increases by 15, then it increases by 10, and lastly it increases by 5. Similarly, let's have a look at if we kept labor constant with three units, but we allowed capital input to be variable and increased by one unit each time. So if we have a look, we see that the marginal product of that capital input as capital increased by one unit each time, keeping labor fixed, it also increased, output increased, but you can see that increase each time it diminishes. It first increased by 20 when we increased our capital input by one unit to two. Then it increased by 15 when we increased our capital inputs from two units to three, it increased by 15, that change from 90 and 75 and so forth. So that is an important thing to consider. So if you recall from chapter three, you learned about your indifference curves, showing you the different combinations of two goods that would yield the same level of satisfaction for the consumer. Now we turn our attention to production the supply side and we are going to have a curve called an isoquant. Now an isoquant is a curve that is going to show these different combinations of our inputs now, labor and capital, that will yield the same output. And an isoquant map, similar to an indifference map, right, is going to represent a graph that combines a number of isoquants used to describe a production function. Now if you take the information from table 6.4 and you represent it in a figure, you have your graph here 6.5. So on the vertical axis you can see we have our capital per year and on the horizontal axis you have labor per year and these two inputs are combined to generate some output. Now we are going to see that we have three isoquants. Let's start with Q1 
So Q1 shows the combinations of our two inputs, labor and capital. That's going to yield 55 units of output per year. Q2 is going to show the combinations of labor and capital. That's going to yield 75 units of output. And Q3 shows the combinations of labor and capital that yields 90 units of output per year. So if we look at these various combinations that we have, A, B, C, and D, we can see that at point A, to obtain that 55 units of output of year, on this isoquant, it could require three units of capital and one unit of labor. Similarly, that output could be achieved by using one unit of capital and three units of labor. So different combinations of those two inputs generating the same level of output. And that is what this isoquant represents. If you look at B and C, those are on higher isoquants. So the further away these isoquants are from the origin, the higher the output is going to be. But in order to achieve that, you're going to need a greater combination of these inputs, labor and capital. So at B, you can see that three units of capital was required, but the inputs of labor increased from one unit to two units. And similarly at C, you had three units of capital and three units of labor in order to achieve that output of 90 on this isoquant Q3. Now very carefully look at what happens when capital is kept fixed at three over there and labor is allowed to vary. What we see is diminishing marginal returns. So notice what happens when labor is increased by one unit each time from one unit to two units to three. So that is looking at points A, B and C respectively. We're keeping capital fixed at three units per year, but labor is increasing by one unit per year. And you can see that output is increasing from 55 to moving on to the next isoquant to 75 and then to 90. But it increases at a diminishing rate. So we have diminishing returns, diminishing marginal returns to labor more specifically. So when we increase labor by one unit, output increased by 20. And when we increase labor by another unit, output increased but now only by 15 and so that process would continue and that represents diminishing returns to labor diminishing marginal returns to labor two final things before we conclude part one of the slides that you need to think about is the input flexibility that is available and diminishing marginal returns now managers can choose combinations of those inputs labor and capital to minimize cost and they need to be aware of those combinations that they can choose ultimately they would want to maximize their profits and we'll see this later on in when we look at chapters seven and eight so isoquants shows that flexibility that firms have when making those decisions they can obtain a particular output by substituting one input for another. We saw that on the isoquant, that you could substitute one input for another. You must also remember that diminishing marginal returns exist. So even though labor and capital are both variable in the long run, it is useful for the firm choosing that optimal mix of inputs to think about what would happen to output if, as each input is increased, if one input is held fixed. You saw that when capital was held fixed at three units and labor was allowed to vary, it led to an increase in output, but it, it led to lower and lower incremental output. So the isoquant becomes steeper as more capital is added in place of labor. And when more labor is added, the isoquant becomes flatter.